Part 1. You will hear a man talking to a woman about hiring a car. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hello, how can I help you? Hi, I'm Carlton Mackay and you booked me some flights recently to Australia and some internal ones? Oh yes, uh, Mr Mackay. I remember you now, of course. Well, I find I'm going to need car hire while I'm in Sydney after all. I think you said you could recommend a good value company? Yes, that's right. Cost-wise cars. They're very good and don't charge lots of extras. They have three offices in the Sydney area, including one office right at the airport. So I'll just book it online? Yes, you can book online, but you should have their phone number too, just in case. Mm, of course. That's 1800 705 639. It's on the website, and you can get a discount if you quote your booking reference from us. Oh, uh, what's that? I mean the one you got from me when we booked your flights. Uh, I have it here. Uh, yeah. 743002. Oh, thanks. I guess I've got it at home, but I'll write it down again in case. <sighs> a discount is good. So, uh, where exactly is the office? I'll be coming to the domestic terminal from Melbourne. It's immediately outside the international terminal. OK. And another thing I want to check is, will they be open when I arrive, or is it just office hours? Hmm, well, they open at quarter to seven and close at 6.15 in the evening. So, let's see. You're due to land at ten past six. By the time you've collected your bags and so on, which will take a little while, they won't be open. But if you arrange it in advance, they can wait for you. You do have to pay an extra thirty dollars for that, though. OK. Well, I'm staying near the airport the first night, so I could go back in the morning and save a day's hire? Yes, that'd be better. That'd save you about $50. Do you know what kind of cars they have? Quite a variety, I think. Uh, the best value should be under $60 a day, with luck. That would be the Echo, I guess. Sorry? E-C-H-O. Like when your voice bounces back? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. I suppose I have to book online before I leave? Mm, that's the best way. Uh, they won't deduct any charges until you finish with the car, but they do need your credit card number when you book, and of course they'll want to see your driving licence when you collect. How long will you need it? I'm in Sydney for seven days. I'll only actually need to use it on three or four of those days, I hope, but I'll keep it for the whole week. I guess it's going to be a few hundred dollars. Can you suggest anything I can do to keep the cost down? Oh, you get quite a big discount if you do less than a thousand kilometres in the week. Oh, that's good. I don't suppose I will be driving that far, actually. But, oh yes, the other thing I should mention is the insurance. It's included in the price. Oh, that is good value then. Yes. 
But what you must remember is that it doesn't cover anything except the car, so you must be careful not to leave anything at all in it when you park, because your luggage isn't insured, even if it's out of sight, locked in the boot. Yeah, well, I think my travel policy will cover that, actually. Good. OK, and can I return the car outside office hours? My flight home is very early in the morning. Can I put the keys through the door or something? There's a secure box just outside the office on the pavement. You just drop the keys in there. Oh, good. And one other thing. You should remember to buy petrol before you leave it. If you don't drop the car back with a full tank, you get charged to fill it. I recommend you go to a supermarket before you go out to the airport. Thanks for the tip. Not at all. Do call in again if there's anything else I can help with. I will. Many thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about employment interviews. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the Local Workforce Center, and she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment, the interview. Sandy, what is an interview for, and what's the best way to approach it? A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance. And make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post, the more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. Most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions, but don't dwell too long on non-job-related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So, if the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that again show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. The more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become. You'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, Maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student of landscape architecture discussing a project with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. So, let's hear what you're doing for your next project. I've decided to design a roof garden for a supermarket. I've been looking at some on the web, and I think that a garden on top of a building is the up-and-coming thing. OK. So you've done a bit of reading already? Mm hmm What benefits would there be for the client? Why do you think a supermarket chain would be willing to meet the expense of construction? You do realise that would be the first thing they raise. <laughs> yes, I know. But I'd explain that in spite of the initially high expense, they would save that much in approximately five years. Hmm. Well, 
I'd have to do sums. I mean, calculate specifically. Yes. How would the saving come about? Mainly through lower heating and aircon bills.、Uh -huh. The extra insulation offered by having a layer of living plants in the soil would make a huge difference. Okay, but they might feel the expense of maintenance would be an issue. After all, supermarkets don't normally employ gardeners. What I thought was, if they made it a community garden, rather than a simple low maintenance green roof, so there'd be public access. Oh yes. Ah. Then there'd be a sense of ownership in the local community, and people could take responsibility for it, instead of the supermarket paying a commercial company, and it'd really boost their public relations. That's a good point. And have you been looking into how roof gardens are built nowadays? I'm still exploring that, but if I take advantage of the latest technologies for roof gardens, it shouldn't be too difficult. But in any case, you have to use lightweight materials. But that's a matter of making the right choices. You can even use quite traditional ones, such as wood, for the planting areas. Yes, that's what I thought. It'll look good, and it isn't too heavy. But for the basic construction, the issue you have to address first is the material used between the building and the garden. You mean the barrier fabric,、mm. which ensures there's no chance of rainwater leaking down into the building. Yes, nowadays that is very good and quite easily sourced. Then, on the other hand, there's the business of water within the roof garden itself. Ah, you mean drainage?、Mm. That's an important feature of the construction in any roof design. Yes, but I think most drainage issues have been well understood for quite a long time. Okay, but another thing is with plants in an exposed situation, you usually need to find ways to optimize rainfall. Yes, because rainwater is best for the garden if you can store it for when it's needed. What I've been looking at are some buildings which use fairly conventional storage tanks, the kind that have been in use for decades, but have them linked to modern automatic watering systems. Sounds complicated. <laughs> It's less so in practice than it sounds, I think. I've been researching them, and actually, the latest ones definitely work very well, and they can be electronically regulated to suit the local microclimate. Hmm, that sounds interesting. You seem to have been doing some thorough research. <laughs> Make sure you reference all your sources when you write it up. Yes, sure.、Um, uh, there's one more aspect I'd just like to run past you if there's time. I want to include a light feature in the design. Ah,、uh, of course. I've got a sketch here. Let's have a look then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Well, I was really impressed by something I saw on a roof in Cornwall, and I'd like to design something similar.、Um, you have an area of planting, and I'm thinking of installing this lighting in an area filled with low-growing evergreen shrubs. Hmm. You'd have to have lights and things well away from anywhere children might be. But I can see this could be very effective, if a bit complicated. How would it work? On this drawing, this is a section view.、Hmm. You have this low wall on the right. Yes, that's it. This is just one element, and these areas would be repeated all round the planted area. I think this will probably be a wooden wall using reclaimed timbers, with an angled ceramic top surface. Perhaps even ridge tiles, like they use on roofs. Ah,、oh, yes, that'd be just the sort of thing,、hmm. <laughs> and that'd make it weatherproof.、Um, and then the heavy-duty electric wiring comes up through the floor, just outside the planted area, and into the wall. 
Then it's brought through to a projector low in the side of the wall, and that sends a beam of light along the fiber optic cable. So there's no electricity in the actual lights. The fiber optic goes across the surface of the soil in the planting area. Yes, that's the beauty of it. Mm. The shrubs will soon grow to cover it up, of course. And then the cable goes past a wooden post, which is between the shrubs and can be a support for them as they grow bigger, and then runs up into each element of the installation. So the light beam is carried up to the top of each element and illuminates a kind of conical glass cap? Mm -hmm. I see. Is that the bit which would glow in the dark? Yes. And what's the cap supported on? Is it a wall? No, it's a slender acrylic rod, uh, like the stem of a flower or mushroom, which the cable runs up inside of. Well, I'll be interested to see the final drawings. Oh, thank you. I'm looking forward to putting it all together. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. Instead of terms up to 13 weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six-term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively. He investigated 39 studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardised test scores. His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term. He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills. So, the problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. 
Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed, and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem. Before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools. And the results they achieved, they all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes, and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved, and this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive in maths in general. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you will now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.